Lyndon LaRouche and the LaRouche movement have expressed controversial views on a wide variety of topics. The LaRouche movement is made up of activists who follow LaRouche's views. Economics and Politics According to Matko Metrovi, Emeritus Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Economics of Zagreb, Croatia, LaRouche's economic policies, developed from originally Marxist beginnings, call for a program modeled on the economic recovery program of the Franklin Roosevelt administration, including fixed exchange rates, capital controls, exchange controls, currency controls, and protectionist price and trade agreements among partner nations. LaRouche also calls for a reorganization of debt worldwide, and a global plan for large-scale, continental infrastructure projects. He rejects free trade, deregulation, and globalization. Marxist Roots Lyndon LaRouche began his political career as a Trotskyist and praised Marxism, he and the National Caucus of Labor Committees abandoned this view in the 1970s. LaRouche no longer opposes capitalism as an economic system, and his analysis of political events is no longer phrased in terms of class. According to Tim Walforth, during and after his break with Trotskyism, LaRouche's theory was influenced by what he called his theory of hegemony derived from Vladimir Lenin's view of the role of intellectuals in being a vanguard helping workers develop their consciousness and realize their leading role in society. He was influenced by Antonio Gramsci's concept of a hegemon as an intellectual and cultural elite which directs social thought. LaRouche's theory saw himself and his followers as becoming such a hegemonic force. He rejected Gramsci's notion of organic intellectuals being developed by the working class itself. Rather, the working class would be led by elite intellectuals such as himself. LaRouche was influenced by his readings of Rosa Luxemburg's The Accumulation of Capital and Karl Marx's Capital developing his own theory of reindustrialization, saying that the West would attempt to industrialize the Third World, particularly India, and attempt to solve the economic crisis both by developing new markets in the Third World and using its cheap and surplus labor to increase profits and minimize costs, see neocolonialism. To oppose this, LaRouche argued for a reindustrialization of the United States with himself at the vanguard of the effort allowing him to personally resolve the crisis of capitalism. Though his arguments have since been stripped of their quasi-Marxist language and citations, his core theories have remained essentially the same since the late 1960s. Dialectical Economics, An Introduction to Marxist Political Economy In Dialectical Economics, An Introduction to Marxist Political Economy a book published in 1975 by D.C. Heath and Company under the pen name Lynn Marcus, LaRouche tried to show that numerous Marxists ranging from the Monthly Review Group to Ernest Mondel, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro and the Soviet economists had failed to correctly understand and interpret Marx's writing. Marxists he admired apart from Marx himself were Rosa Luxemburg and Yevgeny Priyabrajhensky. According to a review by Martin Brenfenbrenner in the Journal of Political Economy, about half of the book was devoted to dialectical philosophy, with a strong epistemological stress, with the other half devoted to discussions of economic and general history, anthropology and sociology, and actual economics including a surprisingly large helping of business administration Brenfenbrenner noted that LaRouche seemed to have more private business experience than the great majority of academic economists, including a familiarity with the way speculative overcapitalization, operating at the borders of white-collar crime, creates fictitious capitals that later do not match their actual earning power. Like Thorstein Veblen, LaRouche subscribed to an overcapitalization theory of economic depression. According to Brenfenbrenner, LaRouche viewed conventional economics as a withered arm of philosophy, which had taken a wrong turn towards reductionism under the influence of British empiricists such as Locke and Hume. LaRouche's definition of reductionism was as follows. The fundamental fallacy of ordinary understanding is the delusion that the universe is reducible to simple substance 
or the more Hume-like view that the content of human knowledge is limited to simple substance like, self-evident sense perceptions. This discredited outlook whether it takes the naive mechanistic or the equivalent mechanistic outlook of empiricism is termed reductionism. All varieties of reductionism are formally premised on the fallacious assumption of formal logic, that the universe can be represented as discrete points interconnected by formal relations. From this it followed, Brenfenbrenner said, that LaRouche viewed bourgeois economists' concern with prices as reductionism, versus the Marxian concern with values. The reductionist fallacy then lies in adjusting a value theory like labor theory to fit in with price theory, in LaRouche's view, economists should work in the opposite direction. According to Brenfenbrenner, LaRouche viewed capitalist America as headed for a kind of fascism not much better than that of the Nazis, but he noted that LaRouche's own vision of socialism, and the trade-off between necessity and freedom in a centrally planned economy, seemed apt to result in the justification of a different kind of dictatorship. Judging from his controversial manner, impresses at least one reader as a me for dictator type to whom it would be dangerous to entrust the task of drawing any boundary between the domain of freedom and that of necessity or order. LaRouche's Campaign Platforms The campaign platforms of LaRouche and his followers have included these elements. A return to a gold-based national and world monetary system, and fixed exchange rates, and replacement of the central bank system, including the U.S. Federal Reserve System, with the National Bank. A war on drug trafficking and prosecution of banks involved in money laundering. An emphasis on large-scale basic economic infrastructure, including the building of a world land bridge of railroads and a tunnel under the Bering Strait, the building of nuclear power plants, accelerating research on fusion energy the North American Water and Power Alliance and rebuilding or nationalizing the country's steel industry. A crash program to build particle beam weapons and lasers, including support for elements of the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. Opposition to the USSR and support for a military buildup to prepare for imminent war. Growth in food production and a farm debt moratorium. Low interest rates and opposition to the Graham-Rudman balanced budget law. Later orientation. According to China Youth Daily Online, LaRouche was once a Marxist, but now supports capitalism. He supports public control of financial capital and low interest loans. LaRouche said banks should not be bailed out, but be placed in receivership by the state. He said that a firewall should prevent state aid from being diverted to speculative entities, which should be allowed to fail, and that such failures would clean up the financial markets. LaRouche believes in the principles of the New Deal of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and favors state intervention in the economy. LaRouche also said that he supported the approach of U.S. Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, who established a banking system geared to develop production. Italian economics minister Giulio Tremonti said that he had encountered LaRouche at a debate held in 2007 in Rome, and that he appreciates LaRouche's writings. According to an article by Ivo Cazzi in Corriere della Sera, a group of Italian senators led by Oscar Peter Lini asked the Berlusconi government to tackle the financial crisis using legislation developed by LaRouche in 2007. The legislation proposed that public money should save only the commercial infrastructure required for the financing of productive enterprises. The triple curve, or typical collapse function, is an economic model developed by LaRouche which tries to illustrate the growth of financial aggregates at the expense of the physical economy and how this leads to an inevitably collapsing bubble economy. According to the China Youth Daily online interview, LaRouche's main point is that the real economy, production, is dropping while the nominal economy, money and financial instruments, is going up. As the nominal economy greatly overreaches the real economy, an unavoidable economic crisis ensues. Since 2000, the LaRouche movement has called for a moratorium on third world debt, opposed deregulation, 
According to LaRouche's publications, LaRouche has consistently called for re-regulation of utilities, transportation, health care, under the Hilburton Standard, the financial, especially the speculative markets, and other sectors. They support the renewal of Glass-Steagall Act regulations on banks. In 2007, LaRouche proposed a Homeowners and Bank Protection Act. This called for the establishment of a federal agency that would place federal and state chartered banks under protection, freeze all existing home mortgages for a period of time, adjust mortgage values to fair prices, restructure existing mortgages at appropriate interest rates, and write off speculative debt obligations of mortgage-backed securities. The bill envisioned a foreclosure moratorium allowing homeowners to make the equivalent of rental payments for an interim period, and an end to bank bailouts, forcing banks to reorganize under bankruptcy laws. A LaRouche spokesman said that bank bailouts reward corrupt swindlers with taxpayer money. The proposal attracted support from Democrats at city council and state legislature level. Pennsylvania Democrat Paul Kanjorski opposed the bill, stating it would involve government seizure of every American bank. Mike Kalpitz of Housing Predictor stated that LaRouche's economic forecasts had been correct, and that he might have received more mainstream credibility had it not been for his controversial history. Neoplatonism LaRouche's philosophy references an old dispute between Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle believed in knowledge through empirical observation and experience. Plato believed in the forms. According to LaRouche, history has always been a battle between Platonists, rationalists, idealists, and utopians who believe in absolute truth and the primacy of ideas and Aristotelians relativists who rely on empirical data and sensory perception. Platonists in LaRouche's worldview include figures such as Beethoven, Mozart, Shakespeare, Leonardo da Vinci, and Leibniz. LaRouche states that many of the world's ills are due to the fact that Aristotelianism, as embraced by British philosophers like Locke, Hume, Hobbes, Bentham, and represented by oligarchs, foremost among them wealthy British families, has dominated, leading to a culture that favors the empirical over the metaphysical, embraces moral relativism, and seeks to keep the general population uninformed. LaRouche frames this struggle as an ancient one and sees himself and his movement in the tradition of the philosopher kings in Plato's Republic. LaRouche and his followers use Neoplatonism as the basis for an economic model that posits the absolute necessity of progress. Economies evolve in stages as humanity devises new technologies, stages that LaRouche compares to the hierarchical spheres in Kepler's model of the solar system based on the Platonic solids. The purpose of science, technology, and business must be to assist this progress, enabling the Earth to support an ever-growing humanity. Human life is the supreme value in LaRouche's worldview, environmentalism and population control are seen as retrogressive steps, promoting a return to the Dark Ages. Rather than curtailing progress, because of dwindling resources, LaRouche advocates using nuclear technology to make more energy available to humanity, freeing humanity to enjoy music and art. In LaRouche's view, the people opposing this vision are part of the Aristotelian conspiracy. They may not necessarily be in contact with one another, from their standpoint, are proceeding by instinct, LaRouche has said. If you're asking how their policy is developed if there is an inside group sitting down and making plans no, it doesn't work that way. History doesn't function quite that consciously. Left and right are false distinctions for LaRouche, what matters is the Platonic versus Aristotelian outlook, a position that has led LaRouche to form relationships with groups as disparate as farmers, nuclear engineers, black Muslims, teamsters, pro-lifers, and followers of the Ku Klux Klan even though LaRouche counts the Klan itself among his foes. George Johnson, in Architects of Fear, 1983, has described LaRouche's Neoplatonist conspiracy theory as a distortion of a real philosophical distinction.
he has written that the resulting philosophy can be applied to any number of situations in a manner that becomes plausible once one accepts its basic premise. In his view, it forms the foundation of a conspiracy theory that rationalizes paranoid thinking, an opinion echoed by John George and Laird Wilcox in American extremists, militias, supremacists, clansmen, communists and others, 1996. Writing in the New York Times in 1989, Johnson described LaRouche as a kind of Alan Bloom gone mad who seems to believe the nonsense he spouts, a view of the world in which Aristotelians use sex, drugs, and rock and roll and environmentalism and quantum theory to support wealthy oligarchs and create a civilization-destroying new dark age. Conspiracies LaRouche wrote that conspiracy was natural in human beings. In 1998, he responded to critics of his conspiracism, such as Daniel Pipes and said that Pipes wrongly believed that all reports of conspiracy are axiomatically false. LaRouche's critics, particularly Dennis King and Chip Burlett, characterize his current orientation as being a conspiracist worldview. They say the Marxist concept of the ruling class was converted by LaRouche into a conspiracy theory, in which world capitalism was controlled by a cabal including the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, Henry Kissinger, and the Council on Foreign Relations. Daniel Pipes said that LaRouche personalizes his conspiracy theories, and associates all of his adversaries with the forces of darkness. EIR in 2007 ran an investigative report titled Vast Right Wing Conspiracy Edit Again, with a new twist. It says, Perhaps the only name that sends the VRWC gang more into orbit than either Bill and Hillary Clinton, is the name Lyndon LaRouche. The very same apparatus that waged a billion-dollar slander campaign against the President and the First Lady throughout much of the mid and late 1990s, has an even longer track record of venomous slander and frame-up campaigns against LaRouche and his political movement. Of course, the reality is that it was the Bush-Cheney campaign, backed by the Scalia Supreme Court, that actually stole the 2000 election in Florida. In 2001, LaRouche said that rogue elements within the American military took part in, or planned, the September 11, 2001 attacks as part of a coup d'etat. The British Conspiracy LaRouche is known for alleging conspiracies by the British. LaRouche has said that the dominant imperialist strategic force acting on the planet today is not the United States, but the Anglo-Dutch liberal system of the British Empire, which he asserts is an oligarchic financial consortium like that of medieval Venice, more like a financial slime mold than a nation. According to this theory, London financial circles protect themselves from competition by using techniques of controlled conflict first developed in Venice and LaRouche attributes many wars in recent memory to this alleged activity by the British. According to Chip Burlett and Dennis King, LaRouche has always been stridently anti-British and has included Queen Elizabeth II, the British royal family, and others, in his list of conspirators who are said to control the world's political economy and the international drug trade. According to Jonathan Vankin and John Whelan, LaRouche is the most illustrious Anglophobe. These views are reflected in three books authored by members of his organization. Dope, Inc. by David P. Goldman, Konstantinos Kalimtgis, and Jeffrey Steinberg, 1978, ISBN 0-918388-08-2 This book discusses the history of narcotics trafficking, beginning with the Opium War, and alleges that British interests have continued to dominate the field up to the modern era for example through money laundering in British offshore banking colonies. The heart of the conspiracy, according to LaRouche, is the financial elite of the City of London. The Civil War and the American System by Alan Salisbury, 1979, ISBN 091-838-8023 alleges that British interests encouraged and financed the secession movement and supported the Confederacy against the Union in the American Civil War, 
because they preferred North America to be a primitive agrarian economy that they could dominate through policies of free trade. The New Dark Ages Conspiracy by Carol White, 1980, ISBN 0-933488-05X alleges that a group of British intellectuals led by Bertrand Russell and H. G. Wells attempted to control scientific progress in order to keep the world backward and more easily managed by imperialism. In this conspiracy theory, Wells wished science to be controlled by some kind of priesthood and kept from the common man, while Russell wished to stifle it altogether by restricting it to a closed system of formal logic, that would prohibit the introduction of new ideas. This conspiracy also involved the promotion of the counterculture. The Queen and Prince Philip According to book critic and columnist Scott McLeamy, the emergence of the is all the more surprising, given that LaRouche himself has long since become the walking punchline to a very strange joke. He is known for some of the most Baroque conspiracy theories ever put into circulation. Members of the LIM now deny that he ever accused the Queen of England of drug trafficking though in fact, he did exactly that throughout the 1980s. At the time, he won admirers on the extreme right wing by denouncing Henry Kissinger as an agent of the KGB and calling for AIDS patients to be quarantined. In 2004, in a segment about the death of Jeremiah Duggan during a LaRouche Youth Movement Cotter School in Wiesbaden in March 2003, BBC's Newsnight rebroadcast a BBC interview with LaRouche from 1980, in which he said about the Queen, of course she's pushing drugs. That is, in the sense of a responsibility, the head of a gang that is pushing drugs, she knows it's happening and she isn't stopping it. A 1998 editorial in LaRouche's Executive Intelligence Review cited a statement by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Daily Telegraph that described LaRouche as the publisher of a book that accuses the Queen of being the world's foremost drug dealer, characterizing it as a bit of black propaganda and a reference to the book Dope, Inc which laid bare the role of the London-centred offshore financial institutions and allied intelligence services, in running the global drug trade, from the time of Britain's 19th century opium wars against China. Evans Pritchard further said LaRouche had claimed that the Queen was involved in the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. The Executive Intelligence Review responded that Evans Pritchard's article was pure fiction, written in response to Executive Intelligence Review reporter Jeff Steinberg's appearance on a British ITV television program about the Diana controversy. In a brief part of an interview with Steinberg broadcast the following day by Channel 4's dispatches, Steinberg said that while there was no smoking gun proof that Prince Philip asked British intelligence to assassinate Diana, he could not rule out the possibility. Leo Strauss LaRouche's initial essay on the influence of Leo Strauss within neoconservatism and the George W. Bush administration, The Essential Fraud of Leo Strauss, was written in March 2003. In the same year, a series of pamphlets entitled Children of Satan later consolidated into a book, began appearing. LaRouche charges that there was a conspiracy dominated by what are called Straussians, followers of Leo Strauss within the Bush administration, and that the dominant personality in this conspiracy was Dick Cheney, whose photo appears on the cover of the book. LaRouche claimed that these conspirators deliberately misled the American public and the U.S. Congress in order to initiate the 2003 invasion of Iraq. He writes that the Straussians created the Office of Special Plans in order to fabricate intelligence and bypass traditional intelligence channels. According to LaRouche movement member Tony Papert, an important part of this theory is the LaRouchean analysis of the ideas of Leo Strauss which borrows heavily from the writings of Shadia Drury. Robert Bartley of the Wall Street Journal has condemned LaRouche's views on this subject, and says that it may have influenced other commentators who subsequently published a similar analysis, such as Seymour Hersh and James Atlas of the New York Times. Bartley quotes the assertion by LaRouche Movement member Jeffrey Steinberg that a cabal of Strauss disciples, 
along with an equally small circle of allied neoconservative and Lee Kudnick fellow travelers have plotted a not-so-silent coup using the September 11 attacks as a justification, similar to the Reichstag fire of 1933. Bartley complains that Strauss's words are twisted from their meaning in order to justify the theory. Canadian journalist Jeet here writes that LaRouche's followers argue that Strauss is the evil genius behind the Republican Party. Political science scholars Catherine and Michael Zuckert say that LaRouche's writings were the first to connect Strauss to neoconservatism and the Bush foreign policy and initiated the discussion of the topic, though the views about it changed as it percolated through to international journalism. Bush Family The Executive Intelligence Review EIR, published an article by Anton Chaitkin alleging that Prescott Bush had persevered with his comrades in the old Auschwitz gang and that the smoldering bodies in Auschwitz followed logically upon the race propaganda festival which had been staged by the Harriman Bush Enterprise a decade earlier in New York. EIR published a book, George Bush, The Unauthorized Biography, by Webster Griffin Tarpley and Anton Chaitkin, in 1992 which said that virtually all the Nazi trade with the United States was under the supervision of the Harriman Bush interests, and that Bush's family had already played a central role in financing and arming Adolf Hitler for his takeover of Germany, in financing and managing the build-up of Nazi war industries for the conquest of Europe and war against the USA, and in the development of Nazi genocide theories and racial propaganda, with their well-known results. The president's family fortune was largely a result of the Hitler project. The powerful Anglo-American family associations, which later boosted him into the Central Intelligence Agency and up to the White House, were his father's partners in the Hitler project. In 2006, the LaRouche Political Action Committee and EIR published LaRouche to Rumsfeld, FDR defeated the Nazis, while Bush's collaborated. LaRouche blasted Rumsfeld, reminding him that it was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt who defeated Hitler and the Nazis, while many American right-wingers of the 1930s and 40s were promoters of Mussolini, Schalmer Schacht and Hermann Goering. And among the extreme American fascists and Nazis of the period, there were some who openly sympathized with Adolf Hitler, by intention or practice. Let us not ignore the role of George Schultz the man behind the Bush presidency, the power of Vice President Cheney, and the promotion of Don Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense. Even leading Republicans know Schultz to be an outright totalitarian, who has used the Bush presidency to impose a Pinochet model of top-down dictatorship and radical free market economics upon the United States. Schultz's promotion of the privatization of war, on the SS model, has been backed. LaRouche noted, by Felix Rahatan. Panic Proposal and AIDS In 1974, an organization affiliated to LaRouche predicted that there would be pandemics in Africa. When AIDS was first recognized as a medical phenomenon in the early 1980s, LaRouche activists were convinced that this was the pandemic about which the task force had warned. LaRouche and his followers stated that HIV, the AIDS virus, could be transmitted by casual contact, citing as supporting evidence the high incidence of the disease in Africa, the Caribbean and southern Florida. LaRouche said that the transmission by insect bite was thoroughly established. John Grauerholtz, medical director of the BHTF, told reporters that the Soviet Union may have started the epidemic and that U.S. health officials aided the Soviets by not doing more to stop AIDS. AIDS became a key plank in LaRouche's platform. His slogan was Spread Panic, Not AIDS. LaRouche's followers created Prevent AIDS Now Initiative Committee, Panic, which sponsored California Proposition 64, the LaRouche Initiative, in 1986. Mel Klenitsky, CEO Director of Political Operations for the LaRouche-affiliated National Democratic Policy Committee and LaRouche's campaign director, said that there must be universal testing and mandatory quarantining of HIV carriers. 
20 to 30 million out of 100 million people in Central Africa have AIDS, Klenitsky said. It is spreading because of impoverished economic conditions, and that is a direct result of IMF policies that have destroyed people's means of resisting the disease. Klenitsky said that LaRouche believed that not only drug users and homosexuals are vulnerable to the disease. The measure was met with strong opposition and was defeated. A second AIDS initiative qualified for the ballot in 1988, but the measure failed by a larger margin. In response to a survey which predicted that 72% of voters would oppose the measure, a spokesman called the poll an obvious fraud, saying that pollsters deliberately worded questions to prejudice respondents against the initiative. He additionally said that the poll was part of a big lie, which hunt orchestrated by Armand Hammer and Elizabeth Taylor. As early as 1985 NDPC members ran for local school boards on a platform of keeping infected students out of school. In 1986 LaRouche supporters traveled from Seattle, Washington to Lebanon, Oregon to urge the school board there to reverse a policy that would allow children with AIDS to enroll. In 1987 followers tried to organize a boycott of an elementary school in the Chicago neighborhood of Pilsen, sending a van with loudspeakers through the district. They disrupted an informational meeting and according to press accounts told parents, the blood of your own children will be on your hands if you allow this child with AIDS in your school, or shouted at opponents, he has AIDS. He has AIDS. LaRouche purchased a national TV spot during his 1988 presidential campaign, in which he summarized his views and proposals with respect to the AIDS epidemic. He said most statements about how AIDS is spread were an outright lie and that talk of safe sex was just propaganda put out by the government to avoid spending the money required to address the crisis. LaRouche-affiliated candidates used AIDS as an issue as late as 1994. Opponents characterized it as an anti-gay measure that would force HIV-positive individuals out of their jobs and into quarantine, or create concentration camps for AIDS patients. According to newspaper reports, the LaRouche newspaper New Solidarity said the initiative was opposed by communist gangs composed of the lower sexual classes and he warned of the recruitment of millions of Americans into the ranks of AIDS-riddled homosexuality. Environment and Energy Metrov says LaRouche follows Vladimir Vernadsky in seeing the human mind as a force transforming the biosphere into a higher form, the newsphere. LaRouche favors a highly industrialized civilization reaching for innovation and interplanetary colonization. The movement says that the theory of man-caused global warming prevents the development of emerging economies. It also says the top-level organizations in the command structure of the environmental movement include the World Wildlife Fund, headed by Prince Philip, the Aspen Institute, and the Club of Rome. According to Chip Berlet, pro-LaRouche publications have been at the forefront of denying the reality of global warming. The LaRouche movement's 21st-century science and technology magazine has been called anti-environmental by Mother Jones magazine. LaRouche Publications denounced nuclear winter, the theory that nuclear war could lead to global cooling, as early as 1983, calling it a fraud and a hoax popularized by the Soviet Union to weaken the U.S. Some of the movement's ideas were later adopted by the Wise Use movement. The LaRouche movement opposed ratification of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which failed in the U.S. Senate in 1994. New. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.